bless you. Thank you so much for joining us today at our hour of power here at the Mount Carmel Church. Um, we thank you so much for joining with us. Our uh, Bible study students and worshipers are in the house, in the building, and we are excited to see them. We're excited to see you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you again uh, for allowing us to assemble in this sacred space. We pray, God, that you will shower it with your love and with your power. God, we pray that your word might be explained thoroughly to the point where we understand it. It impacts our lives and make a difference, not only in our lives, but in our church and in our community and our families. Lord, we love you. And we pray that you would continue to walk with us. Thank you for these moments. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, before we get started, let me say to you that um, if you have not had an opportunity to vote, I do encourage you to do so. Uh, early voting has already started. Um, the election day is upon us. And it is interesting that one of the things that we don't think about is local elections are far more important than national elections. And traditionally, we will turn out for a presidential election, but we are slow to turn out for uh, local elections. And local elections impact our lives on a daily basis. Uh, you talk about school boards, you know, um, those are very important elections. The people who are running the school boards, they get to determine what the curriculum is gonna be for our children. They get to decide what books are allowed in their schools. Uh, municipal elections, I don't know if, they, if that covers uh, the library board or whatever, but libraries decide what books come into the community by way of the library and which ones are banned. Now they have a book ban going on across the nation you know, it, it, I believe it emanated, it started in Texas where the school boards in Texas are redoing history, American history. And in some of their textbooks, they have taken the word slave out and replaced it with employees, you know. So they're trying to write slavery out of the American narrative. You know, it's, it's, it's insane. And I was listening to one politician talking about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and um, President John F. Kennedy. And she said, if President Kennedy were alive and if Martin Luther King were here, they would be Trump supporters. The tragedy is, now we know, we know better. You know, we, we're at that age, we know better. But I have two grandchildren who won't know any better. And they will be exposed to this revisionist history. And they will have changed the whole role and movement of Dr. King and John Kennedy and will make them into something that they weren't. They, they will just change the history. And school boards have that type of power. So voting is important locally because these are some of the things that we have to have representative there to keep that kind of foolishness under control. City government, Joe Biden ain't coming down here to make sure potholes are filled on 42nd Street. That's city stuff, you know. Um, um, and, and so we, we have to get involved in 
local politics. I know this is an off year. This is not a presidential election. It, it, is, it is local, it is state. And then we have the election deniers who say that the election was stolen with no proof, no evidence at all. Just the election was stolen. This lady in Arizona who's running for governor says the election was stolen. And in Arizona, the Republican uh, legislature hired a firm to come in to recount the 2020 election results. It was their firm. They chose it and they were pro-Trump people. They chose them. After they finished their work, they said there was no evidence of voter fraud, none. These are Republicans doing it. And this lady who was running for governor keep saying the election was stolen, even though Bill Barr, um, President Trump's attorneys general, all of his cabinet people, his pollsters, his campaign people, all of them told him that there was no voter fraud. And yet 60% of the ballots in the United States have candidates on them who deny that the election was legitimate. That's what we're dealing with, you know. So we, we have to get out there and we have to vote, you know. And there is a conspiracy afoot that they're stacking local political offices with election deniers and people who no longer believe in democracy so that even if you vote, the people of Indiana vote a certain way. If a small group of individuals don't like the results, they're in position of power to change it, to take away your vote, to take away your voice. They just change it and make it into what they want it to be. And when that starts happening, your democracy is over. You know, so we have to get out there and um, and vote. And speaking on that vein, I want to look at the gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 5. And Jesus is teaching the people of Galilee uh, who are living in Rome, with, uh, living in, a, in the Roman government. They are a colony of Rome and they are marginalized, they are pushed to the side. Their dignity as humans had been stripped away. Uh, they were considered valueless to the society. And Jesus is teaching this community how to live together in community, living under the dominance of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire had co-opted the religious leadership of Israel and was controlling the people of Palestine through religion. You know, they were, the, the religious leaders were in cahoots with, uh, with the Roman Empire because the, the religious leaders knew that at any time Rome could wipe them out or at least outlaw the practice of Judaism. They knew that. And the religious leaders made their living off of Judaism, off of the religion, through the, the, the compulsory temple tax, the 10% temple tax, uh, through the sacrificial um, uh, system where they would come and sacrifice the animals for the remission of their sins. After the animals were sacrificed, what do you think the food went? It went to the priests. When they paid their 10% 10, 10 temple tax, that went to finance the temple and to uh, help the lifestyle of the religious leadership of Israel. So they had a financial stake in it. But if Rome came in and outlawed worship of Judaism, well then that would put the religious ruling class out of business. 
they don't have a means of income. And so in fear of that, they worked in cahoots with the Romans to help control the people of Palestine through religion. And even though, um, uh, even though they taught from the Old Testament, and we understand that the Old Testament, you have the law and the prophets. The scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law taught mostly from the law, thou shall and thou shall not. Rarely did they teach from the prophets. And the reason they didn't teach from the prophets is because they knew of the revolutionary and explosive message of the prophets. The prophets were always calling heads of state and people of power into accountability because the prophets understood that the role of the king was to be the arbiter of justice for the people of Israel. That is, he was supposed to be the conduit through which the justice of Yahweh can be disseminated in the land of Palestine. And when the king didn't do that, the prophets rose up and shook their finger in his face and told him, you know you're wrong. You know this is not, you, you know what your role is as king of Israel. You're supposed to be the administrators of justice and you're not, you're exploiting people. And the, 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 the prophets also rose up and preached condemnation to Israel's colonizers, whether it was the Babylonians, the Assyrians, or the Persians. They rose up, the prophets did, and spoke out against colonial domination. Well, in the New Testament, Rome is the colonizer. So where are the prophets raising up, speaking truth to the, to the Romans, and condemning them prophetically for oppression and colonizing the people of Israel the way the Old Testament prophets did, you don't see them. Because the Jewish ruling class, the teachers of the law, stayed away from teaching of the prophets because it was too explosive, it was too revolutionary, so they boiled it down to the law to keep the people of Israel passive and submissive to Roman colonial oppression. And this is the audience that Jesus is teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. One of the things about Jesus, whereas you see the scribes and the Pharisees, they are always quoting and teaching from the law, the first five books of Moses. Most of Jesus's teaching came from the prophets. And it was the prophet's functions again to challenge systems of domination and oppression. Most of Jesus' teaching came from the prophet. In fact, the first lesson in the book of Luke that Jesus teaches, he takes a text from Isaiah 61, where Isaiah is challenging the powers of Babylon as the Babylonians were oppressing the, the, the Israelites. And the first text Jesus takes is from Isaiah 61, which set the trajectory of Jesus's ministry that I'm going to be using as my text and as my model for ministry, the prophets. I understand the piety of Moses, but I like the public protest of the prophets. And so Jesus spent a lot of time dealing from the teachings of the prophets to inform the people of Israel. And here Jesus is talking to a colonized group of people, trying to teach them how do we live together in this environment. Jesus called that the kingdom of God. You know, this, this, is, this is kingdom living. And Jesus says in Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, 
how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. He says, you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people put a light, neither do, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its light stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus refers to the people of Israel, the people that he is teaching as salt. Now that's, that's a compliment. Here are people that have been marginalized, they have been pushed to the side, they had been dehumanized, and yet Jesus is teaching these people and he refers to them as salt. Now salt was a rare and valuable commodity in Jesus' day. It's, it's not so much now, I mean, you can get salt for little or nothing. In fact, I run from salt because it drives up people's blood pressure and whatnot. I, I don't want nothing to do with salt. But in Jesus' day, it was a rare commodity. It was expensive. In fact, sometimes it was used as currency for exchanging for goods and services. Sometimes employers paid their employee, not in cash, but in salt. It was just that valuable. In fact, the root word salt, S-A-L, is the same root word for salary. That's where the word salary comes from. It's a derivative of the word salt. S-A-L-T, S-A-L-A-R-Y, salt, salary. Come from the same family of word, which Jesus is saying to his people, you are so valuable. He starts off the Beatitudes by saying, blessed are the poor, blessed are this, blessed, to let them know you are a blessed people. And your blessedness is not so much demonstrated through your material possessions. Not by your cars, not by your cash, not by your fancy clothes, not by your beautiful house. Not, and, and that is, don't get me wrong. If you got that, you're blessed. But that's not the definition of blessedness. God does bless us with things, no doubt about it. But what real blessedness is cannot be measured by things. Because if we measure blessedness on the basis of the things we have, then Elon Musk, is the most blessed man in the world because he got the most money. You know, he's more blessed than I am because he got more money than I do. Bill Gates is one of the most blessed men in the world. If you want to measure blessedness on the basis of what you have. And so the person at the bottom that doesn't have anything is not blessed at all. But Elon Musk, the richest man in the world, is the most blessed man in the world. That's foolishness. Especially when we're talking about Jesus, a man who was poor. Stop listening to people tell you that Jesus was rich. Had one guy on television saying that when Jesus was born, the, 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 uh, the wise men came and brought him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, and that set Jesus up for the rest of his life. He was rich, loaded, because of the gifts that the wise men brought to him. But if you keep reading that narrative, 
on the eighth day when his parents took him to the temple to be dedicated, they brought two turtle doves. What does that mean? In the law of Moses, when a boy child was born, a gift was required to be taken to the temple and offered. For people who were rich, they were to offer all of this stuff, calves and bulls and all of that. But the people who were poor only had to bring two pigeons. When Jesus was dedicated, Mary and Joseph brought pigeons, which indicates Jesus's poverty. The brother was raised in Nazareth. The hood. And so Jesus not only identified with the poor, he didn't identify with the poor through empathy. Jesus was not a privileged man who identified with the poor through empathy, but Jesus was a poor man who identified with the poor through experience. He got ready to feed some people his ministry didn't have the money. All of those people came out, 5,000 men, not including women and children, they came to the, to the crusade, which is part of Jesus's ministry. They had been hanging out with Jesus. And these people, you, these were hardworking, rural people that Jesus was preaching to, hardworking. You didn't get a day off. It wasn't an eight hour work day, five days a week, and you get two days off. No, that didn't happen until Henry Ford came on the scene. Back then, you worked from sunup to sundown. They were hard working people. And if they didn't work, they didn't get paid. If they didn't work, they didn't eat for that day. It is not like I go to work, I get my paycheck on Friday, and I got this, but no, they got their money on the day they worked. And if they didn't work, they didn't get money, and that hurt their pocket. So when they heard Jesus was coming to town, they had to make, they had to plan their time off. And they knew that when they take time off, they're not going to be able to recoup the money that they would have made if they had gone to work. And if I don't make my money, I don't eat. So they had been hanging out with Jesus. He had been teaching and he knew they were hungry. And he turned to Philip and said to him, the treasurer, you know, we need to feed these people. We know what the deal is. We know they took off from work. We know they didn't get paid and we know they're not going to have food and they're going to travel back home. Jesus said, I don't want them to faint, fall out, collapse from hunger as they're traveling back home after spending the day with me. I want to feed them. I want to feed them. I want to take care of them. Ask the treasurer, can we do it? Nope, we don't have it. How many times have I asked Vicky? Uh... Can we do this? Nope, we don't. So, so Jesus understands what it means when a ministry doesn't have the resources to meet the needs of the community. He understands. If Jesus was rich, then Philip would have said, give me a minute, I can take care of this. We can feed them all, but they didn't have it which indicates what Jesus was working with. And so Jesus is a, is, a, is a poor man speaking to poor people living under the domination of Rome and of the religious um, hierarchy of, of, uh, of Israel. Yet he says to these people who have come to hear him speak, you are valuable in that you are the salt of the earth. I know people say that you're not about anything, but you are salt. 
You are valuable. Salt not only had a value that was equivalent to money, but salt was also valuable because it was used as a preservative. And people still use salt, companies still use salt to preserve their food. You know, they, and, and, and back then they didn't have refrigeration the way we have today. So when they had their meats and their other goods and produce, they preserved it with salt to keep the rot and keep the decay from eating into the meat, from eating into their produce, they salted it down. They do it today. You know, all of those, um, process, all that processed food that, that we eat, you know, it's, it's been on the, on the shelf for three weeks and it didn't rot yet. <laughs> How come it ain't rotten? Because it's filled with salt. And then we get it and eat it, and our blood pressure shoot up. And we're trying to figure out how can we handle it? You're eating salt. Read the stuff, the, 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 the nutritional value on the back of those packages. Those potato chips you're eating. That tuna fish sandwich I'm gonna eat after this. Google the salt content in the tuna fish sandwich at, at Subway. Watch how much salt you eat. They got to do it that way, number one, because it preserves it, keeps it for longer. Number two, it's delicious. <laughs> I had to change my diet. And it was difficult. Because I had to move salt out of my diet. And I'm trying to find salt substitutes and all of that because salt is so delicious. I mean, I eat um, those, uh, what's the name of those nuts? Cashews. And you got cashews that's lightly salted and you got cashews that are not salted at all. Guess which ones taste the best? <laughs> <laughs> so, salt has a function. And Jesus is saying that you are blessed. And being blessed people of God, there is a function that you have to demonstrate your blessedness. And the function that you have to demonstrate your blessedness is not driving around the city in a fancy car with I'm blessed on the back of your license plates. If you want to do that, that's fine. That's good. You know, it's not your testimony. I'm too blessed to be stressed. It's not so that you can go around bragging how blessed you are and show people your rings and watches and jewelry and your designer clothes and your Gucci bag and all that. That is so shallow because none of it can help you when your heart is broken, when you're down, when you're depressed, none of that can help. Robin Williams, the late comedian, had everything, but he couldn't handle depression. He died by suicide. How many people got so much stuff and still can't find peace? Exhibit A. Kanye West. The brother got everything and he is a genius. A musical genius. But he can't hold it together. He's a billionaire. And he can't hold it together. So the things you have 
is not the measure alone of your blessedness. Jesus is saying here, you are blessed because you are chosen by God. That's the measure of your blessedness. And as chosen people, you are the salt of the earth. I know Palestine said, uh, the, uh, the Roman government and all of them, they say you're nothing. You, you just cast off, you, you really don't matter. You don't mean anything, but you're the salt of the earth. That is, you are the basis of the economy. I know they don't want you to know that, but you're the basis. You stop working, y'all, you gonna starve. But Palestine is gonna suffer as well if you stop working, because if you stop working, you don't pay taxes. And if you don't pay taxes, this whole thing collapse. The temple, everything, Herod, the whole thing collapsed because it's built on the backs of the marginalized. The reason this country is what it is is because it was built on the backs of our ancestors. After the Revolutionary War, when the United States, when, 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 when the colonies, the United States, pushed back against the Brits, they were tired of being a colony of, Great, of, of Britain. And the war broke out. They said, we're no longer, we're not gonna be your colony anymore. We're going, to organ we're going to be an independent country. The power is going to be here and not in Britain. So they fought this war and they, the, the colonies called it a holy war because they felt they were oppressed by the British. And they believe that oppression was against the will of God and it is. And they fought believing that God was on their side to give them liberty and liberation from their colonial oppressions from the British. The hypocrisy is they fought for liberation from oppression and then turned around and oppressed my foreparents. It was okay for them to oppress us, but it was not okay for Britain to oppress them. And so after they pushed the Brits out, one of the largest cash crop was tobacco uh, and cotton. Cotton wasn't king yet, it was tobacco and other indigo. When Britons, after, after they were defeated, when Britain stopped all of the imports from the colonies to Europe, America was almost bankrupt. You can't survive as a country without international trade. No way you can make it. That's why when they start talking about um, putting sanctions and embargoes against other countries, stop trading with other countries, that, that shrinks their economy. And you can't survive unless you're trading internationally. That's what happened to Haiti. That's why Haiti is the poorest nation in this region because they've been blackballed by the West and by Europe. Haiti has major natural resources, but the West will not buy from them, why? Because Haiti back in the day rose up under Toussaint Leouverture who was the general of the Haitian army and he pushed out the French, he pushed out the Britons, the Brits, and he pushed out the Spaniards because they had colonized Haiti and was taking cotton, indigo, tobacco from Haiti and they got rich off of it. But when Toussaint Leouverture defeated them and pushed them out, the West said, we're not doing business with you anymore. See how you survive. They became the poorest nation because they've been blackballed by the global economy. You can't make it as an economy without global trade. And so our foreparents, when the United States had been blackballed by Europe, 
and couldn't trade with them anymore, the economy started shrinking. They were panicking until cotton came. Cotton became king. That's when they started proliferating the slave trade, bringing more and more Africans over here so that they can go out in those fields and pick cotton. That saved the United States. Because the white folks wasn't going to go out there and pick cotton. They starved first. They went and got your four parents and mine, put them out in those fields, and they started picking cotton. Before you know it, the South was supplying two-thirds of the world with cotton. They got filthy rich. And then you have the ancillary businesses that's not in the cotton industry, but next to the cotton industry, like clothing and uh, bedding and everything else that's cotton that you need for cotton. I mean, it became king. Made the United States a economic superpower. And from that point forward, the United States never looked back. Kept moving forward and became the global superpower that it is. But it happened on the backs of people that they had off society. You are the salt. Because you are so valuable that without the African-American community, this country wouldn't be where it is today. We're the salt. Can you imagine sports without us? Ugh. You remember basketball back in the day? When they all had on those little bitty shorts, running in circles, passing the ball to each other, just, just running around, passing, passing, nobody dribbling, and then just run up and then shoot a little layup and then run back. What nobody in the stands. But then when Bill Russell, Kareem, Wilt, Brenda's brother, those guys showed up in the league, then the fans crowded in. Can you imagine football without, you know, can you imagine no black colleges, no HBCUs, no black scientists? What would this thing be without us? We're the salt of the earth, salt of the earth. But not only that, we're salt in the earth just the way salt is used to keep meat and other perishable stuff from perishing the, the microorganisms that may have eaten its way into the meat and corrupted the meat and spoiled the meat and made the meat rotten. All of that is stopped and sometimes it's reversed by the salt. What are you saying? If we are the salt of the earth, one of our functions is to become involved, is to integrate into this world's systems. And when we integrate into the world system, our function is to keep those systems from decaying. Because microorganisms eat their way into the meat and corrupts the meat. So that when you have racism, sexism, homophobia, xenophobia, eating into America's structures, if we are the salt, our job is to protect the meat. What do you mean? When you see it happening, say something about it. When you see sexism happening, say something about it. When you see structures in place that keep women down, say something about it, do something about it. When you see corruption in your organization, your job is to do something about it. Why? Because I want to preserve the organization. If I don't say anything, I'm going to allow this destructive bacteria to eat its way into the organism and you're going to kill it. We're trying to preserve it. We're trying to preserve America. That's our job as a salt. We're trying to preserve it. But you've got these corruptive elements 
And we see it every single day. In fact, one of the political parties have built their campaign on lies. The big lie. These are lies and they have a lot of people, a huge constituency following a lie. You cannot build a political system or keep a country alive building it on lies and negating other people's story and negating other people's story. You can't do that and have a successful society. So we, as salt of the earth, the function of our blessedness is not just to ride around in your car with I'm blessed on your bumper sticker, but to become salt, that is, to become engaged in systems and challenging the corruption that we see in systems, whether it's in church, whether it's in your family, whether it's on your job, whether it's in government, wherever we see corruption, our job as salt is to preserve the organism to keep that corruption from killing it. You can kill a church with corruption. When you see corruption taking place in a church, you can kill it. And if you are the salt, you have to do something about it. You can't just sit there and let it happen. See, that's why the verse 13 said, you are the salt of the earth. But if you read back at verse 11 and 12, he says, blessed are you who, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, persecute you falsely, say all kinds of evil things because of me, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The prophets also function as salt because one of the functions of the prophets was to point out corruption and challenge it. So what Jesus is doing, he is equating us, our job function, our job description with that of the prophets whose job description was to be the salt of Israel, and that is to speak out and to combat corruption with prophetic utterances. When I see the king corrupt, I gotta say something. When I see rich people corrupt, I've gotta say something. When I see the poor act in the corrupt ways, we have to say something because it is our job to deal with corruption because if we let corruption go unchecked, it's going to destroy all of us. So we're trying to save this thing as salt of the earth. We're trying to save it. And Jesus is saying, that's your, that's your function particularly within your own community. You know, now, we love our community. We see stuff that goes, that go on in our community and we have to speak to it in love, you know, but you can't just single out individuals, people without connecting it to policies. See, one of the things we do is we condemn people and ignore policies. Policies influence people to behave in ways that are unseemingly because of political policies that have been put in place that influence people's behavior. What do you mean, Pastor? Here's what I mean. Poverty is not natural. Poverty is a social engineered reality. When you have poverty, it didn't just happen. You have policies, poverty because of policies that have been put in place 
that favors people with resources and punishes people who are marginalized. It happened most pointedly in, in France during the French Revolutionary War back in the 1700s when Thomas Carlyle, who is the, is the authority on everything pertaining to the French Revolutionary War, he looked at the events that led up to that war, and he looked at the, 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 um, the, uh, the wealth gap between the rich and the poor, and he said it was, it was, it was expanding. You know, he talks about the political policies that were put in place that kept the poor at the bottom while the rich stayed at the top. And then you got Charles Dickens who come along behind uh, Thomas Carlyle and he uses Carlyle's work in that profound prologue when he talks about the tale of two cities. You remember it was the best of times or the worst of times? It was an age of reason, it was an age of foolishness, it was an epoch of belief, it was an epoch of incredulity, it was the springtime of hope, winter of despair. It is when we had everything, it is when we had nothing, it is when we all, all on our way to heaven, it is when we headed in the opposite direction. And what, what, what Dickens is talking about is two classes in the same city with polar opposite experiences. For the rich, it was the best of times. For the poor, it was the worst of times. For the rich, it was an age of reason. For the poor, it was an age of foolishness. For the rich, it was a springtime of hope, but for the poor, it was a winter of despair. These systems have been put in place intentionally to keep the poor at the bottom. And when you are in survival mode, beloved, you act differently than when you're not. And the people we see in our communities, most of them are in survival mode. There are those of you who work with the, with the um, with the food pantry, and you see people every week, and they come and they have an attitude, you know, of entitlement that you owe me this, and you need to be doing this for me, and, and I'm gonna get as much as I can, and I know you require an ID for me to come, but I'm going to get a fake ID so I can come back earlier than when I was supposed to come. Man, they're in survival mode. They're trying to make it. And we have to understand that. We have to deal with that. When you see people breaking into people's houses, trying to get stuff, many times they're in survival mode. They're trying to make it. And we have to be sensitive to that. And it's not all their fault. They have been victimized by a system and kept at the bottom. But Jesus said, it is those people. Jesus had his crowd, but not everybody in Israel was for Jesus. You know, there were some people like, man, I ain't hearing that preacher. I don't care about that. Well, they said he raised the dead. Yeah, whatever. They, they lied. You know, they said he, he opened the, the eyes of a blind man. Mm -hmm, yeah, where's the blind man? I want to talk to him. You know, you, you always have that, that type of crowd. And so Jesus said, your job is to be the salt of the earth, but not only that, the light of the world. That is, let your good works, what good works, Jesus? Let your good works before men. He says, let your light, you're the light of the world. A light built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people put a, a lamp under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everybody in the house. In the same way, let your light so shine before others so that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is that. What good works? Being the salt. That's the good works that Jesus is talking about. Being salt. Being a preservative, expressing your value as being a preservative to keep our community from rot and decay. Those are your good works. When you function as salt. 
And when you're functioning as salt, when you're standing up against systems that would corrupt and corrode a community, a country, a city, when you are standing up against those toxins and those bacteria and those microorganisms that eats its way into a society and corrupts it and kills it, when you stand up as salt and speak out and push back and try to reverse the effects of decay, that's the good works. And they are see your good works and they are glorified your Father in heaven. Okay, we're going to stop here. All right. <laughs> if there's one that's viewing us and, and streaming with us on today and you have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, you have that opportunity right now. You can come and you can give your life to the Lord. You can give your life to Christ. Paul said, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If you're with us today and you're streaming and you've never done that, you can do it right now. Will you bow your head with me? Lord, God, I come. I believe that Christ died on Calvary for my sins and I confess that with my mouth and I believe, God, that you raised him from the dead. I invite Christ into my life to be my Lord and to be my savior. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the household of faith. We thank God for you. You can connect with Mount Carmel Church by sending us an email, mountcarmelindy.org, uh, and send us an email indicating your desire to connect with our church, and our team will reach out to you and walk you through the onboarding process, and you're united, you're connected, as a member of the Mount Carmel Church. We thank and praise God for you and we love you. Uh, amen. Now, if, if you want prayer, we can do that. We have our, our prayer leaders, uh, come on, uh, Reverend John and Reverend Lola and um, Terea has gone. Is, is she gone for today? Terea? Okay. Terea is going to come. If, if, if you want, if you, and I'm here, if you want prayer, we, we, are, we are ready to do it. That's just if you want prayer. We got Deacon Monica here who can pray. We got Deacon Fred. We got Deacon, Deacon Reese. You know, if you want prayer, you can, you can come. All right. All right, let's get ready to get, oh, next week, the food is going to be the word of God. <laughs> the sandwiches are going to be the gospel. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> y'all feel me? We, we together on that? I hope y'all show sure. I hope y'all didn't just show up for the tuna fish sandwich. <laughs> okay. It's BYOL next week. Bring your own lunch. <laughs> All right. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the communion of the Holy Spirit and the love of God, rest rule and abide with each and every one of us, henceforth now and forever. God bless you and thank you so much.